Welcome to Steam Powered, where I have conversations with women in Steam to learn a bit about what they do and who they are. I'm your host, Michelle Ong. My guest today is Pauline Belford. Pauline is an experienced tertiary education lecturer and freelance education consultant who is an active researcher in the area of computer ethics and accessibility in games. Join us as we talk about morality in games, board game accessibility, academia, and parkrun. Hello, Pauline. Thank you for joining me today. Okay, um, it's good to be here. Yeah, thank you. So this is going to be our first foray into the A part of Steam because you're doing a bit of work in the area of game design, computer ethics, and accessibility. So what drew your interest into these areas? Um, well, it's quite a long journey, I suppose. Um, like I wasn't interested in computer games as a kid. Well, I kind of was interested in computer games, but it was pretty early computer games. And like I'm from quite a working class background and my parents didn't get a computer until I was a master's student. And so like, yeah, I grew up, we didn't have a computer. One of my friends got a computer in 1987 or something. Wow. Um, and the only game we had on it was this golf simulation game. <laughs> so yeah, and we got to play Pac-Man in school and sometimes table thing. That's pretty much it. Yeah. So it was like when I was a kid, actually what I was really interested in um, was politics, which is completely different. And then I was really interested in biology. Um, so I started off as a biology student, but then I discovered that was quite tough and I'm quite clumsy. So I used to make all sorts of like mistakes <laughs> in the chemistry lab and realized wow. this wasn't for me. So <laughs> I went off and I had a gap year between my undergrad and my postgrad. And I realized that sociology wasn't the best thing for getting me a job. And it was just before the year 2000 crisis. So that's why I decided to go and do a conversion course to get into IT. And yeah. from there, it was a bit of a journey into computer games and then into looking at accessibility in games, which kind of ties in, goes back to the social science kind of area that I'd come from. Like, Yeah, so the sociology kind of lends itself to all the work that you're doing at the moment with the ethics and I guess even the game design it would still work apply to because it's about the way people will want to interact and use it. So tell me, um, what kind of work have you been doing in game design and ethics? Well, I have mostly been teaching, but when I started teaching at a further education college, there weren't any qualifications at that level. Um, for people to do um, computer games qualifications. So either you got really good grades at school and you went straight to university um, to do one of the new computer games courses, or you just had to go into a different field. Like, it would be so much cool if we could, if I could like, be teaching computer games. Why isn't there a computer games qualification? So the yeah. computer games, all of the qualifications in colleges um, mm -hmm. are, like, set up centrally by the Scottish Qualifications um, Authority. So you have to go through them. So um, my partner, Michael, and I, um, we went to our boss, and for some reason, we couldn't get, like, all the colleges in Scotland interested. So we were going to go for a, um, a dual college partnership with this one other college in Glasgow and mm -hmm. arrange a qualification that way. That was 2007. But yeah. then that didn't work out for various reasons. Um, including, including change of the personnel but then we managed to get like a proper full qualification design team going forward in 2008 so there we had like representatives from about 12 colleges across Scotland and we managed to put together um, a national qualification and get it approved. That's great so that qualification uh, what does that what does that get you once you've completed that? Okay, so students can either do a higher national certificate or a higher national diploma. And the higher national certificate is seen as equivalent to first year at university, mm -hmm. and the higher national diploma is seen as equivalent to um, the first two years at university. In actuality, so like a few of our students, what they'll do is they'll go off, and because we have group projects that they do in the first year, they get on really well with their teams, and we try and pair them up so that there is one artist one person who's really good at programming and one person who's good at the project management and documentation and everything. So we try and get them 
so that they've got a full complement of skills. Um, yeah. There's also, you know, we have kind of like incubator type projects. So a couple of the teams have gone off and they've basically, you know, set up their own businesses and registered their own businesses through Lease Games. That's brilliant. Um, no, yeah, yeah, nobody's made like, you know, a million pies <laughs> or anything yet. Um, yeah, I know people who have really games and you make like 30 pies or something. <laughs> but, you know, it gives you, it gives you a lot of great skills and stuff to yeah. your CV. But mostly what most of our students do is um, there's good articulation links from the HNC and the HND into either first year or second year at university. So mm-hmm. it basically gives people who weren't able to get in to do that course because they didn't get the math qualifications at school. And there's quite a lot of maths in there as well that they need to yes. have so that they can then, they've got more time to get the skills that they need to go on to university. So it's like a bridging course for some of them? Pretty much, although we do we do try and say, you know, it can be a standalone course and you can go and set up your own company. And we, yeah, at the college that I most recently worked for, we did have good links, um, like with Ninja Kiwi and a couple of other local games companies. So we'd get students like, you know, work placements and things. That's great. It's good that they actually have the choice to, from that program, to be able to choose whether they want to go further into academics or actually start working with the skills that they've learned. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. It is a very competitive industry, though, so, yeah. It is, very much so. But computer ethics is a very specific niche, and it's a really important one, but what drew you to it? Well, I mean, part of the thing is that I'm not, particularly necessarily all that good at the hard technical stuff but you know I've got a sociology degree um I did study a bit of philosophy in my undergrad as well and I'm interested um in ethical questions because I was brought up as a little politician (laughs) you know so I had you know I've got like an actual interest in this kind of area it didn't seem like that many of my colleagues were interested in the area and there didn't seem to be that much around it like one of the first things was so Michael and I have created this case study scandal in academia about the University of Dunglen and this professor who's falsifying his results and putting pressure on his PhD students um, and he's under pressure himself there's all sorts of things happening there so when we first started like teaching back at Aberty in the early 2000s like there wasn't very much teaching about ethics um, but one of our lecturers was interested in telling the students about the case of the killer robot. And I find that really interesting. Mm-hmm. But it's from the very early 90s. And if you look at it, it's like really obsolete. And if you try and use that with students, it's like they don't really understand the case study because, it, you know, it's just not aged very well. So we were like, oh, it would be great <laughs> if we could actually use this. So there are courses that I was teaching at a uh, college where you have to like teach professionalism and ethics but they're pretty dry and the students aren't necessarily all that interested in learning um like the code of ethics for a particular professional bodies they can join why would you want to memorize that um or you know you teach them about exactly. very legislation that they need to know about but again it's quite dry so if we had a better more up-to-date case study um, it's not necessarily a better case study, it's just more mm. update and more relevant. So we're like, yeah, why don't we just write yeah. one? Cool. So what's been the reception to the people who've been working with that case study when you're actually teaching it? Oh, they absolutely love it. I mean, you, you still don't necessarily get 100% buy-in because you will always get students who come into computing who are just like, yep, yeah, I'm here for the programming and I'm here for the math and all this other stuff. Why do we have to do it? And you'd get students getting, like, really um, enthusiastic and excited in class when they're, like, sitting around debating these things. And people would be like, oh, no, I totally, you know, identify with a character in the case study. And they were right. And how dare you say that they're acting yeah. unethically or whatever. You know, so students would get really into it in a way that you can get them to get enthused about legislation or, you know, British Computer Society code of ethics. Exactly. So what other sorts of... Uh... Uh, I guess, the key points of what you're trying to teach them with Scandal Academia? Just that everything isn't black and white, you know, and a lot of things are very nuanced. So I think computing can be kind of like one of those subjects because there are right or wrong answers. 
to a lot of things on it maths there's right or wrong answers but even so there's still good solutions and less good solutions and things but sometimes people will just like read a story and they'll take it at face value and they won't necessarily think about all the surrounding factors so I guess it's about trying to teach empathy a little bit and just being able to put yourself in other people's mm. shoes and just be aware of um, all the different pressures that people are under and how it can be, you know, it could be that there's a problem at the heart of the institution rather than for an individual. Yeah. And I guess partly it's also um, about Michael trying to warn people not to do PhDs unless they're really, really sure <laughs> that's what they want to do. <laughs> I well, know, that is an important lesson <laughs> yeah it's just like when you're being pressured to put in 70 hour weeks um and largely it's just going mm. it's not necessarily even going to get you a job at the end of it depending what you know subject specialism you're in and the likelihood of getting funding because more people do phds than there are jobs for them at the end of it so jobs. there's an awful lot of pressure you also mentioned that there's a lot of exploitation in the area as well. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about that. So my first job, basically, I'd done my master's course and like I was one of the top students on the course. And, you know, so I came to the attention of a few of the lecturers and they're like, oh, you should stick around and do this um, fill, which is lower level in a PhD and they're like well work out they're like you can get a PhD out of it we'll just work out how to fund you didn't happen but um so basically uh, and they're like oh yeah and apply for this job they needed people to do a lot of teaching because they were taking in all huge numbers of students because they were running these conversion courses which at the time were popular but they didn't mm -hmm. want to hire three or four new lecturers or probably they just needed maybe half a dozen new lecturers so what they did was they hired um, teaching assistants and teaching fellows. So basically, I was meant to be doing um, an MPhil slash PhD at the same time as teaching 12 hours a week, not having had any teacher training. And I was getting paid on the same scale as an administrative officer. And because I was trying to do a PhD, I was only doing this, you know, on a part-time basis. So they're basically getting people to largely do the work of a lecturer, except obviously there's no publication requirements, but you got fewer holidays, you got a higher teaching load, and you didn't really get the time that you needed um, to springboard your research. So I spent nearly five years there, and I'd probably have been better going off and looking for a properly funded PhD at a different university. So, I mean, obviously, like, things have worked out pretty well in the end, and I'm... You know, I'm really grateful because I didn't really know what I was going to do. And it was great to see, yeah, I would like to be in academia. But I'd actually like to have a job where I get paid commensurate for what I'm doing um, and actually get the time to do what it is I'd like to do. So is that why you started working on some of those other papers that you've published? Because you mentioned that, that was none of that was funded. Yeah, partly. So basically I started, I don't know what, a little bit of research when I was at what was Edinburgh Telford College. So when I was in a degree, I was only working part-time, but it was pretty good part-time, you know, when you're getting paid for eight pounds an hour, it's quite nice. Um, and so, and I was doing a little bit of contract work as well. So I had the time and Michael was trying to build up a, um, a research publication track record and was applying for grants and things. And because I had the time, and the space um, and I was interested then that's basically why I got involved in that at that time and I think it was the probably the first place where because there, there was one person at um, Edinburgh College who taught all of the um, ethics stuff so I didn't get to teach that but when we went down to Canterbury I got a lot of, of um, teaching to do I was getting to like try and teach ethics to um, students who were like police officers and who were doing like degrees or oh wow yeah and um, so that's quite interesting because you do the same class with a group of computing students um and then you do that class with the police students and you're talking about surveillance you know and data privacy and they just have two different groups of students just two completely different reactions to that yeah 
when you were teaching a program, did you end up having both groups in the same class or were they no. always separate? No, they, they were on different programs. It's just that I taught across different yeah. programs. Yeah. It would be interesting. That would have been interesting to have both of them in the same room. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So how do you assess an ethics unit? Yeah, um, I think that might be one of the <laughs> that computing students don't necessarily enjoy them so much is that, you know, they tend to have to write discursive essays about things. Yeah. So, yeah. Gosh, writing. <laughs> yeah, and also writing about things where there's not necessarily right or wrong answers. So you give them an yeah. ethical scenario, you give them a scenario and you ask them to analyse the scenario from the point of view of two or three of the characters involved in the scenario and you get them to back it up um, with, you know, so they need to mention legislation, but they also, you know, it helps if they mention, you know, professional codes of conduct um, from like a professional body, but also you might have suggested certain, you know, ethics books that they should go and look at and see if they have a particular um, philosophy that they want to apply. So, yeah, it can yeah. be a little bit touchy-feely. So how does computer ethics lead into morality in games? Um, well, it's actually quite interesting because obviously there was a bit of a moral panic about computer games and do computer games make um, their players more violent in the real world? Can we blame computer games for all the school shootings in the United States? Um, although if you look at it, computer games, there's like, I think it's probably now one of the biggest hobbies in the world. So if computer games was responsible for, um, you know, outbreaks of violence, then, you know, why isn't there more of it? And why is it almost exclusively happening in one particular country, which has certain um, legislation on guns and certain attitudes towards guns compared to the rest of the world? But anyway, so there is a bit of panic about, you know, what are computer games doing to our children? And that's quite interesting. And then um, some games decided, right, okay, we're going to introduce, you know, morality systems into our games. But really, they only do it um, in a very shallow way. So um, do you like the Fallout series? I've, I've, okay, I actually don't play a lot of games myself. I am also a casual gamer um, for various reasons. Uh, I can't do first-person shooter. I get motion sickness. I, I like the universes, so I understand. I know Fallout. <laughs> Fallout has got, you know, um, morality systems in there, but basically, you know, you talk to non-player characters and you have to, like, make certain simple decisions. Are you going to do this thing for them? How are you going to respond in this particular situation? But they'll either be, you know, really black and white, um, or there'll be things that, you know, it, it feels like it's going to have an impact on the story, but in the end it doesn't because there's only maybe two or three possible endings. Mm. Um, and you get karma, so you can either be, like, the worst person ever, or you can be like a really, you know, total white knight kind of person. But it can't really, um, like, you get you get karma that says you're more of a good person if you're killing off the bad guys. But it doesn't, it can't ascertain what your motivation as a player or your motivation as you know, the character you're identifying with actually is. So, yeah, maybe you're killing the bad guys, but maybe you're just killing them because you just want to kill every single thing in the game. You know, so it doesn't really address, you know, it's like, yeah, you're doing these things, but are you doing them for the right reason or, you know, what the game developers think is the right reason? And mm. games, um, as you probably know, like there's this kind of magic circle thing. So what you do inside the game, you know it's not reality yeah. and it's not the real world. In terms of morality in games, so when they introduce these branching systems, you'll find that what people will see is like, you know, they're just looking at the dialogues and they're working out, well, what's going to be best for me in terms of what I get for karma? Um, yeah. Or what's the obvious choice? Or it might be that they play the game through once one way and then they play it through a different way. But they're not really thinking, oh, I'm actually having to think about ethics. I'm having to make really difficult decisions here. It's yeah. just, well, what's the best thing for the game? 
Yeah, because you end up either number chasing, like with karma, like if you're just chasing the high number, you're going to go to the thing that gives you the most karma. And the fact that the consequences are not real allows you to divorce yourself from the action as well anyway. So there's no reason why you couldn't be the bad person other than you might feel a twinge of guilt inside for making the poor choice, but there's no actual effect on you as a human being for making that negative choice in a virtual environment. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, have you played Life is Strange? I like that because it's kind of, it's a bit of an empathic puzzler where people sometimes talk, talk about, you know, walking simulation or interactive fiction. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's got that this action will have consequences. And, but you can rewind a lot of the things that you do in the game, but certain things you can't rewind. So because of that, the first time you play it through, at least then you do give more thought to how you react in certain situations. Mm. Um, but a lot of the time you're just thinking, well, I can rewind this so it doesn't matter what yeah. choice I make. But actually, Michael played it through before me and he thought that Kate was always going to die and it was just one of the fixed points, one of the things that you can change. And then I played it through and she didn't die because I was kinder to her. <laughs> um, I'm more concerned about All right, wow, okay. <laughs> so, and then at the end, yeah. So at the end of an episode, you can go in and it shows you, oh yeah, 63% of people made this decision that you made. And so you can compare you know, your decision-making against other people's. Yeah. Uh, so it goes a little bit different to things, but probably it's still, you know, it's still pretty shallow and you do still have the, well, I can always rewind this if it doesn't work out the way I hope it goes. Yeah, there's always a safe point you can go back to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's quite difficult for game makers to actually make a stand about things because they don't want to you know it can be it can help your game go viral if you pick some kind of hot button topic or whatever but then often it's a bit of a lose-lose because like you've done things in a ham-fisted way or whatever mm. um so there was a game um detroit become human i think it was called and it was by the makers of heavy rain and it was about these ai robots and the robots became sentient but the humans were still cheating them as pills. So then they're like, oh, well, what does this say about us? You know, and it was, they were kind of making a bit of a clunky analogy with slavery. But then people were just like, yeah, this is like really ham-fisted and you've just like made a really bad job of it. So it's just like, why even try? So what sort of things could people do, could developers do to kind of start working those concepts in, in I guess, in a more measured way? that people start thinking about it more um i don't know i mean i think the part of the thing is that it's not so much like ethics isn't really in the mechanics the morality isn't really in the mechanics if you put it into the mechanics then yeah. it's just people will just be trying to mini max um this is kind of more like there's a few games which have maybe covered ethics in a better way but it's not necessarily in a way that will make people reflect on it um have you heard of papers please no so papers please is a great game it was i think it was an indie game that was like a surprise hit but basically you're playing like an immigration officer sort of thing so you're like you're on the border um of this country and the country's like got some kind of terrible authoritarian regime and you're trying to make enough money to feed your family and not get fired so you've got all of these people that are trying to get into the country and they've got papers. So you get all sorts of um, things come up. So you get paid for processing people. So the more you can process and the more you can process correctly, hopefully, um, <laughs> then the more money you'll make. So you'll be able to like, pay your rent and feed your kids and pay for medicine if you're, someone in your family gets sick. Um, but if you spend time looking at everyone's documentation, then you're not going to like process enough people, you're not going to make enough money. So you end up doing all sorts of terrible things just to get through <laughs> a day so that you can actually feed your family. And like you're turning down people who've got these terrible soft stories that you don't want to listen to. You're letting people through with documentation that you haven't had time to check. 
you know, and it's just, and the rules keep changing and you get more and more stress heaps on you. So oh, wow. if you actually think about it, then it's like, you know, okay, so this is how some really terrible things actually happen in the real world because you just take people and they just don't have the time to think through, you know, what is the right thing. And it just, you know, it dehumanizes the people that are, you know, applying to enter the country because you just don't have time to actually look at their cases as if they're real life humans. You just have to make pretty quick decisions um, wow. so that you don't starve yourself or get fired. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting way of doing it, just to demonstrate how over time you can start to separate yourself from the human side of whatever it is that you're doing for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the only thing is that, you know, it's very much there in the game, but it doesn't, like, there's nothing at the end of the game that asks you, there's no questionnaire that says, you know, so how did you find this game and what did it tell you about yourself <laughs> as a person? So, you know, so some players will go off and, you know, reflect on, and what it says about themselves and what it says about society and what it says about, you know, um, these institutions or whatever. But some people might yeah. just think, oh, well, that was a good game or that was a boring game and not just really think about the morality of what they were doing and how yeah. it relates to the real world. Well, that kind of happens with all other cases of morality and ethics in real life anyway. You get people who will reflect and other people who just let it slide. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But that's quite cool. That's interesting in the way that they've started to implement some of these ideas. But again, like it's only going to be your small indie, smaller indie games that will start to kind of push the boundaries with these sorts of alternative mo modes of game. Yeah. Your work in doing accessibility, is that in computing as well or is that just in the board game kind of environment that you're doing, people like us? Um, yeah, so in terms of Myself. So, like, Michael has done, I think, some work in accessibility and computer games. But basically, computer games are about 10 years ahead of where board games are now in terms of accessibility. And obviously, like, solving mm -hmm. things like color blindness um, is much easier, I think, um, with computer games. Well, actually, not really. But there are certain things that are easier because you can provide certain accessibility features in computer games. And also computer games have got a much more standardized interface than board games. So part of the thing about board games is you can get quite burnt out on computer games. And even when they're meant to be like a group activity, like I spent so much time on World of Warcraft, um, you know, it's not really as much of a social activity as just sitting around a table physically with people and playing a board game. So yeah, so we got really into board games and then we're looking at them and it's like, yeah, there's no standard interface here. If you're a colorblind, you can play this game. This is like, you know, 2014, 2015, whatever. And we've got friends who couldn't play these games. And so then you start applying yeah. just the kind of reasoning that you've got from a different field. And you're like, yeah, actually, we're not finding very much on the internet about this. So it looks like there's, you know, a space in the market here. So we need to come up with some kind of framework for how we can assess these games and identify what accessibility issues they have and if there's a way um, that they could be made more accessible without taking out, you know, the inaccessibility that's actually where the fun comes from for the game. So, yeah, so that's interesting. Uh, video games are ahead in terms of accessibility, but board games are a bit more inclusive. So yes, yeah, just trying to, yes. So with the board game analysis and the accessibility breakdowns, has that led to any board game designers or distributors kind of coming to you guys talking about how things like that can be improved for people going forward? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously not as much as we would have liked and I don't know if I'm allowed to like name companies or anything but yeah there's like one or two companies who will um always want to talk to us we get review copies of games there's a few organizations that have paid um for accessibility paradigms like pre-release kind of thing so we'll get sent a prototype oh, nice. yeah and we'll do the accessibility paradigm provide you know, maybe six pages of advice and then 
they'll take from that what they can because they might have suggestions that are completely unrealistic or uneconomic but they might, you know <laughs> in there which is easier to implement and will make a big difference um and then like there's a couple of companies yeah. that you know always want to see us when we go to like the uk games expo in birmingham so mm. yeah there it would be good if there were more you know major games companies who were you know taking this as seriously as we would like all games companies to do but you know it's like you know you yeah, have to walk before you can run exactly it's doing a lot of good work anyway, and it's getting some reasonable coverage, even though you guys are on hiatus at the moment. So hopefully, you know, maybe that might pick up again at some point. So we might move on to those extra questions. What hobby or interest do you have that is most unrelated to the work that you do? Um, that's probably running and blogging about running. So, <laughs> so why running? Um, I was into, like, I wasn't... I was rubbish at team sports as a kid. I think that's partly because I don't have very good depth perception and I'm a bit clumsy rather than that I'm just like terrible at sports. But then what it was was a um, park run. So Michael's going to roll his eyes when he um, sees this. But do you, I think you have park run in Australia, but mostly like it's not such a we big do. thing. Um, and you can have like hundreds of kilometers. Uh, I've got a few friends who are hugely into it. It's yeah, crazy. it's amazing. So like I've been doing a bit of running. I got free personal training um, for three months every year for like three years on the trot. Um, because of the college that I worked at, they had students who needed um, basically guinea pigs to be the person that they personal trained for like eight weeks or something so yep. that was fantastic and the, se the second year I had a guy who like was getting me to do all these interval sprints and he was like running's your main thing isn't it and I was like no it's indoor climbing um and um hat and boxing were the things that I was doing at the time and he was like oh he was like he was getting me to sprint at like you know 10 11 miles an hour and things and he's like, you're quite good at running. <laughs> and then a couple of my boxing friends and climbing friends mentioned that Park Run was starting up in Montrose, which is like nine miles from where I live. So I was like, okay, I'll go along to that. I didn't want to go along to the first one because I knew it would probably be packed. So I went along to the second one. And because I'd previously, I had previously done a couple of like, you know, 5Ks, 10Ks. I'd done a half marathon that I hadn't really trained for. I'd done one nine, nine mile run outside. Um, and a few treadmill ones, which are pretty boring. Oh, yeah. So I got to like nine or 10 miles, hit the wall, and pretty much walk around the rest of it. It took me like two hours and eight minutes, and then I didn't really run for a long time. But <laughs> Park Run was just totally amazing. And within about five or six weeks, but I didn't want to run by myself. So within five or six weeks, I was like, well, it's a yeah. running club, but I didn't think I was good enough to join a running club. But their both footers took over all the volunteer roles at Park Run. And I got speaking to one of them, and she's like, oh, yeah, our more relaxed pace runs on a Wednesday. I'm like, oh, well, I've got hat and boxing. I'm climbing then, so I can't really do that. But I told her, like, what kind of time I was doing park running, which was about 25 and a half minutes at the time. And she's like, yeah, you can probably keep up with mm. the Tuesday group. So I went along on the Tuesday. The pace was fine, but after four miles, I was, like, really struggling because it was, like, the distance. I had to run a whole six miles, um, and that was just, crazy but like you know someone stuck with me they always like stuff and wait and things and um a few weeks later someone was like is there anyone in briefing you can run with so i posted in like the briefing community group on facebook i set up an event i got like half a dozen people to come along for a run and um, we set up an informal club and um, so yeah i'm still in touch with like all my running friends from there and within a year you know it's like i just got totally obsessed with running it's just it's just like such a great feeling. It turned out I was quite good at it. I got my park run time down to about 21 and a half minutes. I won a woman only 5k trail race. I got the first footer home at, um, our, at their both footers um, Smokies club race. So I got a cup for that. It was amazing. Um, it, it just turned out to be something that I was really good at. Well, reasonably good at given my age, um, you know, and, and experience and things. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so then I ended up like I run a couple of marathons. I did the Chicago Marathon, I did Loch Ness Marathon. Oh, but then brilliant. I was meant to be doing London Marathon and Berlin Marathon this year, but they both got cancelled. 
um, yeah. which is shame because I really like having things to train for. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the thing is, I'm really competitive. But the good thing about running is you're competitive against yourself. You know, so I'm really happy when yeah. my friends are doing really well, um, even if I'm not necessarily happy that I'm not doing so well myself. But, you know, it's like you can just you can see how you're improving. And it's just runners are the nicest people you'll ever mm. meet pretty much. And the park run spirit is just absolutely amazing. So sometimes I'll go to a park run and treat it as a time trial. But sometimes I go to a park run and I just get talking to someone and I just like, you know, jog around with them in like, you know, 28, 30 minutes, whatever. And it's just great. Yeah. So it's part, it's a lot of it is just this great. community. And then you start writing the race report. Mm. And then so people will read my race reports and they'll be like, yeah, you really captured how I was doing during that race, even though it's about how I was doing during the race. <laughs> you know, and like then you like mention people in it, and they're like, "Oh, you named me in this race report and stuff." Um, and so then, I mean, it's not. It, it's I have quite a you know a small readership, but it's very localized to like you know where I lived and where I ran and stuff. Yeah. So you'd occasionally get people you didn't know coming up to you and saying, "Oh, I hope you're writing a report about this. I'm so and so, and we hope you mention in the report <laughs> and stuff." So it's totally yeah. So. But yeah, I just love running and I, and I love writing and I managed to get to merge the two. So. That's fantastic. So are you, are you still part of the uh, park run now that you're in Sweden? Oh yeah, I mean park runs how I've met a lot of friends here. Like, I mean, not all of the friends that I've met here, but I knew that it was going to be okay because when we came to look at um, Gothenburg, Michael came over for his interview, I came over as well and I was like, yep, that's off park run. So I went along to the park run um, and I was like, yep, it seems quite a small park run. There was maybe about 50 people there and Gothenburg is a city of nearly 600,000 people, whereas the one in Montrose that I went to yeah. when I left, like you get anywhere between 120 and 200 runners a week and that's like a town wow. that has a population, I don't know, 12,000 or something. So it's not as big a thing over yeah. here. But I was like, yep, yeah, it's friendly. They had FICA afterwards. Um, there were, you know, they did the first timers briefing in English. There were expats there. And I'm like, yeah, this is going to be fine. You just turn up to park run and say, hi, I'm new here. I'm going to be your friend. Um, yeah. That's a great way of getting a new community. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, park run obviously, like, shut down in the middle of March because you can't guarantee that there will be more than 50 people. So that's one of the things that stopped. But... Well, yeah. just recently, just like over the past few weeks, um, we've been getting just like a few people together on a Saturday morning to go running, like a wee group of like a mm. Um, You know, we're not we're not doing park run. It's not at that time, and it's not the park run course. But yeah, because we're all missing it. So yeah, yeah. Safe and social distance. Yeah. It's good that you were able to get some of it back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which childhood book holds the strongest memories for you? That one's really tough. Whenever I get asked to pick, like, just one thing, I can't do that. Um, and this is, I thought, I thought about, like, around about four different books, but I have to confess, um, it's really not cool. But it would be, um, like, Mallory Towers by Enid Blyton. I just, like, love those books. Ah. And I think it's partly, like, I'm an only child. Um, and so I think I spent quite a lot of time alone when I wasn't in school so I just loved the idea of like being at a boarding school and constantly surrounded by friends and I identified with Sally who was like you know the quiet sensible one who got to end up being friends with like you know the really <laughs> Daryl by the end of like the first semester or sort of. yeah um but yeah I reread those oh. books quite a lot and when I was 10 years old I actually because my mom was like you really like reading um but why don't you try and write a book so I tried to write a book and basically it was my own rewrite of like, you know, um, first term at Mallory. <laughs> and I find it because we had to get rid of so much stuff when we were emigrating here because we were going from a four bedroom house to a two bed, yeah. two bed apartment. And I find it and I reread it and I was like, oh, I'm so disappointed. That was just absolutely terrible. You know, my writing was... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was like Nina's Lighting book only much, much worse. So... But yeah, she inspired me. To That's all right. Doesn't matter. What do you expect when you're 10? <laughs> yeah, I suppose. But at least you're still writing, doing other stuff anyway, especially with the park run reports. That's good. And 
Uh, what advice would you give someone who wants to get into this field and what should advice should they ignore? So in terms of advice, basically, so you need to know your worth. So don't let yourself get exploited. Um, the computer games industry is well known for, I can't even remember what you call them, but you know, like the kind of sprints when they're coming up to release and people end up like sleeping under their desks and things and putting in, you know, 16 hour days. You can find out who the worst offenders are in terms of the companies that try and pressure you to do that and work out, you know, do you want to work for a company that does that or would you actually be better finding a startup or a smaller company that treats their employees better? Um, one thing about applying for jobs, well, two things actually. So one thing is don't think, oh, I've read the, the job specification, the person specification, and I'm missing this one skill or these, you know, this particular programming language out of five they've mentioned. So there's no point in me applying for the job. Of course you should apply for the job. So they've done studies about this. And you know the majority of women will not apply for a job unless they can tick off every single essential requirement. Tick every box. Yeah, and most of the desirable requirements. Whereas like, a lot of guys will be like, yep, I meet 60% of essential requirements. I'm going to apply for this job. What's the worst that can happen? So in terms of... I guess, career development and I guess choosing your path, how would you consider networking and, you know, finding your links to being able to, you know, find alternative paths, I suppose? There was a paper by a guy called Granovitor, um, I think in the early 70s before my time, but it was about the power of weak ties. Um, and a lot of my career, I think, has been partly down to, you know, being in the right place at the right time and just knowing people who know people kind of thing. So, yeah, it, it's difficult, I guess, being able to maintain networks. You know, it, it can be quite challenging, especially if, like, you have to find opportunities to, you know, reach out or let people know that, you know, you're on the market or if you're looking for an opportunity. But you never know where they're going to come from, like you found, where, you know, all these other kind of peripheral links have just come through for you yeah absolutely I mean I'm probably not the best networker in the world I generally just stay in touch with people that I like but yeah um it is worth just keeping in touch with people even if, if it's just like you know sending them just a quick message you know yeah. every six months or a year or so to remind them you still exist yeah and then it's not so bad when you contact them but even if you're not so great at staying in touch with people as long as you're um, not horrifically bad at it, then don't <laughs> feel you know, nervous about reaching out to people. It's like, hey, I haven't been in touch with you in a while. Just wondering how you're getting on. And then a few yeah. messages later, it's like, you know, actually, I've got this thing happening. I was wondering if you've got any advice. And often people are pretty keen to help. Whereas if you don't ask, then yeah. Yeah, if you don't ask, you don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're better to ask ex- and have them say no and not ask and not get the help you were looking for. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, networking, it's hard because if you, if you're, I guess, either shy or introverted or you, you know, suffer from imposter syndrome, you know, all those sorts of things will stop you from trying to reach out to people, being afraid to ask for things or, you know, just putting yourself out there. So yeah, like you said, as long as you're not horrifically bad at it, then, you know, something might pan out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting you touched on imposter syndrome as well. That's, like, a big thing at the moment. But, yeah. like, if, I think pretty much everyone suffers from imposter syndrome, you know. Yeah. And if you're not feeling like, oh, I don't, you know, I'm not 100% sure that I can do all aspects of my job. You know, if you're not thinking like that, then either you're completely unchallenged in the role you're in or, you know, you're just coasting and not worried about it at all. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's a sign of conscientiousness. So, like, you shouldn't be worried unless, like, there's massive, large chunks of your job where you're just thinking, I don't know how to do any of this. But also, yeah. if you are feeling like that, you should you know, you should feel confident to, like, you know, ask co-workers or colleagues for help with whatever it is, rather than just saying, oh, no, it's fine, I can't admit any weakness, uh, yeah. and I'm just going to try and bluff my way through. 
because that never ends well. No, it doesn't. The big thing that you keep seeing people using a lot is the fake it till you make it kind of ideology. And I think that's, that's true and correct to an extent. Like if you're pushing yourself 10, 20% above what you think you're capable of, then I think the fake it till you make it is totally applicable. You can totally push those boundaries, but you can't fake 80 to 100% <laughs> because that's, that's unreasonable no. and it's unfair on the people you work with as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely, because they're going to have to, in the end, pick up your mess. And you'd mentioned about um, when taking on roles that you can mould a role. What did you mean by that? Um, well, I mean, obviously it depends on the employer and exactly what role it is that you are applying for. But yeah. teaching can be quite good, especially if you go and work for a larger organisation, um, because they'll they'll be teaching more, you know, different kinds of classes. So when I started teaching in further education, because they didn't know who they'd get, then you just get a pretty random timetable. You know, then it's like right, okay, so what courses are there? What is it possible? For me to be able to do it and how do I make it so that I'm the best person for them to choose to teach the things that I want to be teaching um, and as I was talking about their qualification in computer games that qualification didn't exist so basically I got involved in developing that with colleagues from other colleges and so then obviously I got to play a big part and I kind of got to choose um, which modules on that course I wanted to teach because I'd been involved in developing some of them yeah. so yeah, you can kind of mould your job um, to what you want if you can spot, you know, what is it you want to do and how do you make yourself the person that they choose um, in order to do the stuff that you want to be doing rather than just the stuff that needs to be done. That's good. So how do you go about um, making yourself into that person that they would choose to teach the role that you want to teach? Again, there's a bit of an issue of work-life balance because you end up having to spend time in your own time, you know, developing little projects or whatever or studying things that you don't know um, and, you know, just producing your little portfolio to say, look, I've got all this stuff and clearly I'm very good at Unity because look at this great game I've made um, and things like that. So you just bring it to the attention of your boss, the things that you are working on that show that obviously you have the skills in those areas. That's great. That's a good idea. But yeah, again, important to very to consider work-life balance in that case. Yeah. Have you heard of um, deliberate practice? The what, sorry? Um, oh, deliberate, deliberate practice. practice. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So I think it's one of the things that I don't know if Malcolm Gladwell um, covered enough when he was talking about, you know, what was it outliers um but you know you know the whole ten thousand hours to mastery thing but if you do the same thing over and over again so like mm. you know i teach um i spent years where i taught java programming at first and second year university level you know and if you keep you know so i probably have like more than ten thousand hours of doing this but you only get to the end of second year university level so unless i'm doing the deliberate practice i spend time you know, some of my free time basically ensuring that I, my best, my higher level programming skills didn't atrophy yeah. kind of thing. So if you, you know, if you just keep playing fetish jack out all the time, if you're learning a musical instrument, you're never going to become a virtuoso um, on that. You just need to deliberate practice and continually doing things that are just that little bit out of your comfort zone in order to achieve mastery and keep improving. Absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely a thing that people like, people forget that they have to do it, especially if they have to do the same thing day in, day out, and they start to burn out on those things. But by doing the deliberate practice, by pushing yourself a little bit more, you can actually, you know, stave off burnout because you're actually starting to challenge yourself and be interested in what you're doing because it's outside of what you're doing every day. Yeah, but it's also in the Goldilocks zone where it's not so difficult that you just get stressed and burn out from that. Exactly. Um, it's like... I can't pronounce his name. Is, is it Michael Chick Spence Mihai or something? But yeah, he wrote a book about flow 
And it's like one of the ways, it's like everyone's like in search of, you know, the pursuit of happiness kind of thing. But yeah. it's not like, happiness isn't a destination. Happiness is kind of like the journey. And flow is just when you're involved in activities that are just completely absorbing and you've got enough skill and mastery to do them, but they're not too easy and they're not too difficult. And you can achieve yeah. um, this sense of flow. And it can be like that where you spend like four hours programming and then you're like, oh, I'm really hungry now. Oh, wow. How does so much time go past? You know? Yeah, definitely. You just so. get into the zone. Yeah. Touching on so many different topics here. It's been really good, especially in terms of all the things that you need to consider in academia but again not just academia but any time that you're working in industry so yeah that's been very informative uh, thank you very much for joining me today and it's been you know just it's good just chatting about all these things yeah uh, if people want to learn more about what you've been focusing on and what you do where can they find out more information um, well, I'm on LinkedIn. I have to say I don't keep my profile all that up to date. But, yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn at Pauline Belford. Um, me for Like Us, as you said, is on hiatus, but it's going to be back in August, which is only – I don't know when this show is going to come out, so it might be back by the time. Um, but you can find um, me at Me for Like Us, and you can also find me at breakingroadrunners.co.uk where I blog about my running, which may or may not be of interest. <laughs> all good running's still fun yeah great so thank you very much for this it's been fantastic having you on and yeah have a great day yeah thank you you too i really appreciate pauline taking the time today to speak about computer ethics and her experiences in education it was also great to be reminded that we should value the skills that we have to offer and that we have the potential not only to shape the work that we do but also what we want to do to learn more about Pauline and what we discussed on this show, or to connect with us, please visit the Steam Powered website at steampoweredshow.com. You can also learn more about Pauline on LinkedIn, Meeple Like Us, and her running blog at Brecken Road Runners, the links for which will be in the show notes. If you enjoyed this conversation, please let me know. Subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, and share this with your geeky and geek curious friends. To find out other ways to support Steam Powered, go to steampoweredshow.com forward slash support. Thanks for watching.